Hey everybody and welcome to a new episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking and we are finally at episode 109 after a whole lot of five months. So I apologize once again, I've just been swamped with work since the beginning of the year and this week is the first time I got a few days off to, uh, to work on my own stuff. I uh, finished a project so I'm taking about three, four days off to uh, just catch up on other things uh, and that includes Design Cinema. So let's jump right in to episode 109. Uh, this episode is going to be a uh, kind of a follow-up to 108, which was design uh, basics, I believe, right? So today we're going to be calling this design breakdown. And the reason why I want to cover this is because a lot of our students have trouble with this. And I also get a lot of private messages on Twitter asking about how our students go about designing these kind of three-quarter view rooms. Uh, and they're very good training for introduction, I guess, to how design works in the real world. It's a very closed set. It's very small. So students could just spend their time figuring the stuff out. And it looks really easy from the outside, but when you actually try it, it's actually quite difficult. So today I'll break all these steps down once more. And today the cool thing is, instead of a, a sketch, I actually have a very nice example put together by one of our instructors here at the school uh, named Ian. So I'll be showing you guys that as well. All right, so let's just jump right in. Uh, I don't think this episode will be too long because I don't have, to, <laughs> I don't have that much material uh, nor time. So, uh, so let's go for it. All right, so. Without further ado, let's start with 109, Design Breakdown. So this thing here you saw from 108 already. Uh, so let's just repeat it again because it's good to uh, reiterate, reiterate uh, this concept. Okay, number one, start with a good base. Now, uh, let me back up a bit. We are talking about environmental design, especially set design. However, this works for characters as well as uh, exterior or um, external environments, for example, like planets or cities, still works. But in today's episode, we'll be covering just a locked set, like a small little little set, okay, little environment, interior. All right, so start with a good base. So what does this mean? So let me just zoom in here. Let's go full screen here. Man, I'm a little rusty here. I haven't designed, uh, recorded design cinema for, for so long then, but kind of uh, stuttering here. So forgive me if this video comes off a little bit amateur-ish. All right, so boring is this okay a little room so all i gotta do with this kind of stuff is start with a good base find a good reference image that breaks up the geometry right even adding little windows some beams in here maybe even cutting a corner for example here this will be a good base because a lot of our students when they start a room they just start with a literally a rectangle uh, what you want to do is play with the z space for example are there steps in here are there corners in here uh, break the space up like this okay so this will be a good base this will be a boring base because visually, if you look at it, it's really kind of black, right? It doesn't just three, four walls essentially and a floor. There's not much visual areas for our eye to uh, move around in. So the first step we tell our students is please start with a good base. And this generally comes from reference use. Go to the internet, go to the books and see where can you start with. Whatever your design is, doesn't even matter at this point. Start with a good base, even if it's as simple as a bedroom. Most bedrooms are like this but that's kind of boring. We could find a bedroom that has a unique wall, a unique window, a bay window, uh, maybe a little step that could go up to a, a loft area. These are all things that make the base really, really good. Again, I'll show you some uh, examples of that uh, as we go forward. So start with this, okay? Number one, this will actually do about 90% of the work for you if you have a good base. Because of the interesting geometry that you have, it makes everything else that follows it much better. And this applies to everything in entertainment design, including giant AAA video games that have a theme. For example, your Assassin's Creed, your God of Wars, your Red Dead Redemptions, they're starting with a good base and that is history. They're taking a segment of history that's full of interesting forms, stories, colors, designs, and they build their game's story on top of that. So 90% of it has really been uh, I guess uh, planted there already, right? It's been, it's part of history. It really exists. So you don't have to start from zero. So if these giant companies are doing that, or so can you, especially if you're learning. You don't, the thing you want to avoid is make your own base. And unfortunately, even though we say this over and over again, students still do it. They'll make up a random space, they'll make up a random creature, just come from nothing based on zero. So they're making their work actually 90% harder because they don't have that history. It's kind of like making Assassin's Creed, but will make up a random part of history that never took place. Say in 1600s, 
uh, to some random culture that never existed on Earth, a random story that never existed. And to make that work, you could do it, but it is much, much harder. And you generally don't see that at all in entertainment, uh, unless you go to some of the more stranger IPs, but some of your big, big triple A's, they don't do that. They always start with a good 90% base, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, the next thing to do is you want to define a function for this space. Before you put any details in it, what does this space do? If it's a bedroom, okay, then have that in mind, okay? Remember this main function, okay, main function. What does it do? Try not to squeeze too many things in there, just focus on one. So bedroom is just a bedroom. Uh, if it's a power plant, it's just a power plant. If it's the bridge of a ship, it's the bridge of a ship. Just one thing. In entertainment design, this is a general rule to follow. Try not to put multiple things in a single space. You want to break those into separate spaces. So here's your bedroom, here's your function room, here's your storage room, and so forth. So define the main function. So in this case, in this little sketch here, we have sort of a dining living room area, and that's all what it is, right? It's a family room to hang out. So the main space here is for eating. So we have a dining table, and everything else we'll talk, we'll talk about next goes with this function. So number three is gonna be the human factor. So this is the easy detail to put in. So our students sometimes when they start these rooms and start to think about set dressing, they don't know where to start. So today's episode really is about just follow these steps and put all these things in, okay? Human factor, the reason why it's easy is because we can all relate to it. So what are human factors? Human factors are things like a bed, a chair, a table, because as human beings, we kind of need this type of furniture to to uh, survive in this space. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work if you're talking about post apocalyptic kind of world, but in a standard set, these are things that just comes with uh, the basics. You have to have these, right? You have to have a table, you have to have a chair to sit down. So when you start with these details, it already kind of gives you about the 10 or 20% of the base to put in. So you put this on top of your base uh, with a little bit of function in mind, you're starting with something. So in this case, for example, we have a table, we have some chairs, we have a shelf, and we have, uh, for example, doors, a window. These are all for life support, and that adds that extra detail. Number four is function over form details. Okay, so this, this I talked about in the past episodes. So what is function over form? That is whatever you need, design the function to match it. The opposite is form over function, in which by looking at the form, you don't know what it does. This is also another way to design, but it's much more difficult for students to do that. Uh, for example, all your Apple products, or like your iPhones, uh, it doesn't really show what it does. It's a, just a, a rectangle. Even though it contains camera, microphone, like AI, you know, facial recognition, it has all these features in it, but it doesn't show it uh, directly through the form itself versus you go back to a 1980s, uh, like a boom box, a record player. But just by looking at it, all the buttons and all the rewinders on there, it sort of shows you what the function is purely by what it needs to do. So for our students, we generally advise them to use function over form designs. So in this case, uh, this is jumping a little ahead of here, but for example, you have a fireplace. Okay, so that is a function. A fireplace's a job is to heat up this house, right? So then what are the... Uh, things that goes with this in terms of detail. So you don't have to spin your head going, man, what should I add into this room, right? Just use function over form. Since this is the function, for example, logs, uh, little uh, metal tools to move those logs around. Maybe there's a thing in the front to catch the, uh, the burning embers from cop popping out. Uh, maybe a small shovel. This needs to be made out of bricks, some kind of material that could take heat, right? We need a chimney for the smoke to come out. So just by using that logic, you already have some details just for this one little area. Uh, same thing for the uh, dining table. To, for a dining table to function, we need legs, we need a surface, we need chairs for people to sit down. We probably need some kind of uh, lights on top, right? These are all the things you build from a single function it spreads out all the detail that need to support that function. And so hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is not the only way to design. This is an easier way to design for students. Form over function is much harder in which, uh, like I said about the iPhone, the form could be anything and you make it fit the function up to uh, what you want to do with it. So, and that generally is much, much harder. Okay, again, I'll go over all this with uh, Ian's demo that you will see soon, it's pretty cool. Next, these are some smaller things. Don't forget about lighting. This is something a lot of students always forget about. So we look at their set and we tell them, hey, if at nighttime, your set has no way to light, light up. The lighting people don't know what to put the light source. So in this case, we have, uh, I think, added it here, right? So we have lights on the tables, 
uh, chandelier over here, and the little side light here, two sconces here with candles, the fireplace is a light source, another light above the shelf, maybe another light over here. So this way, it's a free detail. Like all of this, this whole episode is about like when students ask, my room looks empty, my set looks empty. These are things you could just add in to dress your set without using too much of your brain power, right? You don't have to sit there and go, man, what do I put in next? What do I put in here? Well, just use these steps. These are things that just have to be there and it makes it easy to add detail, right? We wanna make this, these things easy as possible so you don't get all stressed out and burned out just twirling your head thinking, what do I put in here? Just follow these steps. Okay, next, different materials, right? So in this case, we have, for example, wooden boards. We have carpets, we have bricks, this is probably made out of brick as well. We have a different type of wall material. These all could be materials, and this also breaks up the space. And when this goes into production, you could add interesting things to the texture artist. You can add interesting for the sound designers as you walk across the carpet, walk across the wood. It all gives kind of different feedback to the player. So we always remind students, don't make everything made out of one material, like it's all made out of plastic. Switch things up as you go, okay? Next here is adding animations and sounds. So I just mentioned sound design, but this could be even things that emit sounds on its own. So animation generally comes in two forms. We have static and we have dynamic. So static, static animation are things that don't move from its current position, but they animate on its own. For example, curtains, uh, leaves, right? These call it, they have a little bit of physics to it. Uh, even the little flames on top, the wood flames in here, these things move. So what happens is when someone enters this scene, there's always something that's moving on the screen. So even if they don't do anything, this environment feels like it's alive. So we could use the curtains blowing to signal that there's wind outside. And it gives the players this, this experience that this world is not dead, it is not sterile. All right. So that's the static animation. And then we have dynamic animation. So dynamic anim animation are objects that can move from point A to point B. And this is much harder to do. And it's one of the easiest things to do with dynamic is, for example, adding a pet into the space, like an animal, like a dog and a cat. And you'll see a lot of video games do that. For example, you go to a village, there'll be some uh, dogs walking around, some cats walking around. And same thing, without the player moving, we see that the world is alive. So, and you can do that with sets. It doesn't mean you have to add a human being inside, right? This is an empty set, there are no people here, but you can still add some things to make it move. Okay, sounds, of course, are things like leaves outside, uh, little birds that fly by the windows. All these things, again, I mentioned this already twice or three times already, these are things that add detail to your scene without you having to just sit there and go, man, what do I add? Because we do get students that just show up with an empty room, for example, a bedroom, just a, just a chair and the table and a bed, and they go, I'm stuck, I don't know what to add. Well, what we do is we hand them this sheet. We literally have this on the wall at our school, and we go, did you check this list? Okay, do you have these things in it? And as soon as they check, most of them, they're on step one. That's about it, and maybe, maybe 1.5. They got to about, it's got a bed, so it's got a function but everything else, it's all missing. Like, okay, this, this is a bedroom. How do they drink water? Do they even have sheets? Do they have clothes to change into? What do they do here? All those things are missing. So these things hopefully will add to that. And lastly, we have number eight, which is add uh, personal details. So these are things, I know these are a very rough, thumb, uh, rough thumbnail here, but personal items are things that, I like to call it the non-IKEA things, right? When you go to IKEA, the furniture shops, they're very sterile because they're trying to sell you every single item on display. But in the real world, you have a lot more things than what IKEA is trying to sell you. Uh, for example, in this case, this wall, because they have children, for example, maybe it's all painted up with some crayons, uh, it's all scratched up, uh, some children's play, uh, paintings in there, there's some toys on the floor, the pillows are uh, not exactly matching to the furniture because these are things they bought on their own. Uh, they have different type of plates that are not in set, so they're different uh, different manufacturers. So all these things break up the generic space, so it's not a IKEA set. And that's a word we repeat to our students, students quite a bit. It's like your set looks too much like an IKEA. Nobody actually lives here. This is a showroom. When people live here, their personal items come in. And that's generally is one of the last things we add, but it gives your sets a lot of life. Okay, so let's move on to the little demonstration here. But before we do that, I do want to show you one or two more things. Okay, so by the way, if you haven't seen episode 108, you could go back and check, take a look. I explain all these in episode 108. Uh, this is the image. So again, this applies to interiors. For example, here's the interior, right? Start with a good base. You set dress it with the basic function. 
And then on top of function, you put all the things we just mentioned, the sound, the material, the personal items, the storytelling things, those go in, okay? It works for external environment. So here's just some rocks, so that's your base. So on top of your rocks, which is a really good base, you add your cetras, in this case, it's some kind of village, and then you can put all the things we just mentioned in there as well, which is over here, right? So this is just a village itself that does the function, but that doesn't have the personality. So here we added a story, for example, it's a celebration. It's uh, you know the uh, fall season and harvest time or something, right? So they have a big uh, parade in the village, and therefore you're starting to tell a story. But it still goes in the same water. Whoa, still goes in the same water, which is strong base, right? Again, I'm gonna write this here, 90% right here, okay? And then you add your set dressing for functionality. So what does this place do? Once you have what it does, then you set your set with personal items to tell a story. And this thing also works for character designs. So your strong base, of, if you're using a human, obviously a human, but even a human could have a base. For example, is it a really muscular person? Is it a skinny person? Is it a fast person, right? All these things are your base to start from. And then you set your asset to have a, um, uh, a functionality. So in this case, it could be some kind of wizard, right? a uh, magic user, so they have the staff and everything. But in this point right now, it's still an NPC. It doesn't have the personal items. So you start putting storytelling in there, like for example, they're wearing a special trinket. They have a item that doesn't look like it belongs to the Ikea, right? You could treat your costume designs like Ikea furniture as well. You have the base armor, you have the, uh, the shields and all the weapons, but that comes with whatever, for example, the castle gave you. But what are some personal items you carry with you? Is there a trinket? Is there maybe from uh, this person's daughter, they have a little thing they carry with them on their, on their neck. These are all little tiny details that adds an extra flair that makes these designs uh, come out and also give you details for free. So in this case, I even added a pet line or something. And all of a sudden it goes from an NPC to a character you could somehow relate to. All right, so let me close this one real quick. Let's leave this one here because I'll be using this because I want to show you, uh, let me see here. Let me open up this one. So this is another uh, quick demonstration I showed our students here at the school. And this is related to one of their projects that they've done here, which is to design a, a merchant store in a location that's not exactly, uh, I guess, uh, realistic. We put some kind of environmental factor on it. So some kind of weather effect, for example, it's too cold, it's flooded, it's too hot, right? So that way we could make the students do a little bit of design thinking on top of the architecture. So this was a merchant that I decided to put in a tower. So let me do it this way so we could talk about it. All right, hopefully I'm not rushing through here too fast here. Uh, all right, let's compare to our notes on the left side. Start with a good base. So here, instead of putting the merchant in a standard building with four walls, I decided to put it in a clock tower or some kind of church spire tower, uh, like you see here in the references, right? Like a clock tower. And the environmental effect that I introduced here is that this whole world is flooded, kind of like Venice, right? a little bit of post apocalyptic feel to it. So we've got water in the time period. It's a little bit medieval fantasy, that type of thing. So we're not talking about sci-fi or current day. So here, by having this base, we have done 90% of the hard work because even if you don't do anything, the architecture alone gives you freebie details. So I know I repeated this many times before we, because we do it to our students as well. We repeat, we repeat, repeat, and students, students still come back with four walls, an empty room with some furniture. In it. And you're like, how many times do we say it? Start with a good base because it gives you something for free. You don't have to do anything. Even if you don't use any design thinking, you don't do any of the work. You just simply use the reference as is. You're about 90% there, right? Just like, uh, again, I mentioned those triple A games. You look at something like the latest Assassin's Creed of Van Hella. If you just left castle in the countryside with some villages and trees, you don't put any of the gaming stuff in it. You just put whatever existed in the real world. It's really cool. Why? Because they started with a good base. That's why. So same thing here. By having a clock tower, we get all these details in here for free, including all these pulleys, maybe even the clock itself, all these chains. Really cool, and I can use that to my advantage as the design. Because the next thing is, number two, define the main function. So in this case, it's supposed to be a merchant in this, uh, I guess, I don't know if you call it post apocalyptic even though it's medieval or fantasy, but similar thing, the world went through some kind of devastation, uh, a flood, and people are uh, surviving. And this is a merchant that provides goods for all the townsfolks that live 
uh, nearby. So here, the first thing what I like to do is to do a side view because it helps me figure out the design. To define the function, we already have it. It's some kind of store. So in this case, I decided to put the store at this level. And then I have a bedroom here, which is going to be our number three. Okay, human factor life support. Where is that? Well, in this case, I'm going to put the bedroom up here. And I didn't draw it in this uh, three-quarter view. So uh, anyway, it's going to be up here. But the main function here is a store. And number four is function over detail. And this is the one I really want to talk about uh, for this example. So because it's a store in a tower, we use logic to f uh, figure out what kind of details we add. So let's look at that three-quarter view here. All right. So as a merchant, we need to get supplies in here. So let's use function. How do they get supplies? Well, how about they have scavenger boats? These boats go out to all sorts of flooded zones. They find items that they can scavenge, and then they bring it back to this tower. So therefore, we already have a freebie detail. So this tower, we open up the bottom section here, and various merchants or scavengers come in and they trade their goods, like fishing boats in Alaska, right? They all bring their stuff in, and then the merchant it's, uh, themselves will buy whatever you have. So here's the merchant, for example, they're, where they're uh, merchant uh, master, whatever you call it. And then these uh, scavenger ships come in, the boats, I guess, in this case, they dock here. And then that's one function. Let's just write some stuff here. So that's our number one. Uh, because of that, we have number two, right? The boats have to come in. So we open up a, open up a, a hole here. For the boat to dock, we have number three. So again, these are freebie details. We have to have these to serve the function. And the function started with the merchant but to get to that, we need these details. So the boats is our uh, number one starting point, right? Then we have the two, then we have the three. Okay, how do these people on the boat, if they want to go in and take a rest? Well, we have to have some steps. So there is our number four, right? The ladders to go up. Okay, how do we ship the stuff from the supply boats into the merchant store itself? Well, since the references have all these cool bow towers and have all these clocks with all these chains coming down, I thought we could use those details because they come for free. They're part of the base. So they have these pulley systems that could pull up these supplies up in these cranes. So this could become our number five, another free detail. And once these things are up here, we need to sell them. We have to stack them in, uh, in various shelves, right? So these supplies go in here. But for a shelf to function, we need supports, right? Support system for these shelves and these walls. So that becomes number six. And then to put the supplies in there, that becomes our number seven. So just by doing this one function, uh, which is how do you get the supplies into this bell tower, we have all these details coming out for free. And then let's keep going. To sell these supplies, we have to have a counter of some kind, right? Some, somewhere where the uh, merchant could uh, to exchange money for goods or trade, uh, well, you know, whatever this world is doing. So this becomes our number eight. And for that, we probably need to counter what the actual merchant is at. So that becomes our number nine. Uh, for this, we also need an entrance where customers are coming in. That becomes our number 10. And since we have the uh, we have the customers coming in from the left here, and we have the merchant coming in from the right. So we have different staircase for how they come in. So it's kind of a different entrance. That could become, for example, number 11. And we could go on and on with this. So the core here is uh, we're breaking this stuff down, right? Even though it looks like a sketch, you could actually break it down to many, many little subsections to help you with figuring out the details. Let's keep going here. So we did the function over details, add lighting. Okay, so you can see here they're rough, but they're, they are added in here. We have a couple of light sources on the counters in the, uh, in the shelf areas, right? They're all there. And add different materials, which we have. We have wood, like once again, we can have some stone. We have some carpets. Uh, this is all stone on the walls, obviously, for the tower uh, itself. So we have that covered. Next, add animation and sound. So with anything with water, you already got some really cool stuff because you have water as a base animation. We could put some little fish swimming down there. That could be pretty cool. Uh, this rope that go up and down as a pulley is part of the animation. Uh, what else? Okay, we have these hanging bells. They could animate maybe once an hour, two hours. They ring the bell to tell, tell people nearby that they got new supplies. Could be a cool feature. And also that's a game feature. So as a gamer, if you hear some ding dong, right, some bells ringing, you know that the local merchant has new supplies. Uh, and that's better than popping up some UI on the screen, which is very immersive breaking, right? We don't want that too many prompts because it kind of takes you out of the world. So by having bells ring, then you know that there's supplies there. Right? And, that's, and that adds animation as well. We could potentially put some curtains on these windows here and they can animate. 
And lastly, we have personal details. So here as a merchant, there's not enough uh, room here to put all the details, but this merchant could be who knows who he is, right? It could be a he, she, whatever you want, and give him some personality. Does he have a big lounge chair that he sits in? Uh, maybe it's handicapped, so it's in a wheelchair of some kind, or I don't know what it is, right? That's for you to add. That's a very last minute thing. However, it does add quite a bit of personality into this world. So, all right, so this is just, a, again, a quick sketch, and I'll leave this somewhere, maybe I'll put it on Twitter or something, so you guys can take a closer look. But uh, these are good examples of just practice on your own. Notice how rough these things are, right? You don't have to draw super nice stuff when you're learning about design. Design is all about thinking. Design is about solving problems. And to learn this type of thing, start with these rough sketches just to get those ideas out. Figure stuff out before you jump to a really tight drawing. Because we find that students, sometimes if they skip this, the results, right, the results are not good because they jump right into some really tight details without figuring out all these little steps here. All right, so let me take a quick pause on the video and we'll take a look at Ian's example, which is much, much better uh, than my sketches here. All right, I'll be right back. All right, we are back. So let's now show you the demonstration that Ian have done, which is much cooler than this. Uh, but before we show you that, I'll show you the sketch that I've done here. Let's load that up. I'll leave this one always here so we can refer to it. So this is a demo that uh, done for our students. Again, another rough sketch, but there'll be a much better version of this coming up shortly. So this is a sketch and you'll see that there's a chicken here, right? So this demonstration actually started with a single object, which is just a chicken. So I know it sounds really weird, but we could use this logic to get us everything else in this set. It sounds weird, but it totally makes sense as I explain it. So you see here, here's a cabin in the woods uh, with a bunch of uh, radio equipment. And there's gonna be some uh, radar dishes and receivers on the roof. There's a little fireplace. So here you start to make up a story like, okay, this looks like some kind of UFO conspiracy person living out in the middle of nowhere, scanning government uh, radios and stuff, looking for UFOs, right? So kind of very typical entertainment type things. You see these in X-Files and so forth, and they're very fun. And I'll show you guys how we broke this down step by step to get all these details without using any kind of creativity. I know it sounds really weird, it's like there's no creativity here. It's purely function over form. By having the chicken as a starting point and our function, which is a UFO conspiracy person, of those two, we could then derive every detail from that one, or at least one object, the chicken, and two, the functionality. Okay, and I'll show you how that's done. So here, we'll come back to this without the references because uh, we'll, we'll, we'll We'll show you that as we uh, show you the steps. All right, let's pull up Ian's cool demo here. So incoming, here we go. All right, it's gonna be pretty fun. All right, so he done this in 3D because it's uh, much, much easier to do this in 3D to break these steps down to draw each one on layers, which will be uh, really time consuming. So we built this out in 3D. Oh, by the way, this is all Ian Ho's work. I'll link his uh, website uh, on these descriptions so you guys go check out his work. He's been doing a lot of functional type of design tutorials for our students here, and they're really cool. So after this demo, uh, or after this here, I'll show you some further demonstrations done for our students are really cool, and they even teach me a lot about design. So let's jump into this one. All right, I'll just, uh, just start a layer to draw on this. All right, so you can see here, we have a human for scale, and we have a chicken, okay? So why start from here? You might be like, what? What the heck is going on here? Why are we doing a chicken? Well, if you put a chicken leg and you're gonna, our objective is someone's gonna eat this chicken, you already have a design objective because let's break this down. You have the chicken leg right here. The type of dish it's on already starts the design process because for example, I could have a paper dish, right? The, the paper one that you throw away. You can have a standard dish. You could have a super fancy dish, like, like a homemade dish or something, right? like a thousand dollar dish or something, right? This one's like 10 cents. This one is you know, I don't know, $10. This one's a thousand dollars, right? Then you have like a gold plated one that the king uses that costs like $10. Right? Just by having the dish underneath your ch chicken, you already decided on a design direction. And that's why we started with this with our students. So they don't have to think so deeply like, oh man, what do I do? Okay, plan out your things logically. So in this case, we're doing a conspiracy person in the woods, and that person is not gonna be super rich. They could either eat out of a paper plate or they could eat out of a regular plate. It's gonna be one of these two, which are both acceptable in this case. They're not gonna be eating out of some thousand dollar Hermes or Tiffany and, and a company kind of dish, right? They're, that's just out. So that throws out that design direction. 
and then that moves on to even the type of fork it's on, right? Is it a nice furniture? Is it silver? Is it plastic? Starts it. So let's load in the next one up. We need the cabin that is in. Oops, that's this one here. So without putting any furniture in here, design a cool cabin. And remember, we want a good base, right? So in this one, we use the Z space to break it up. So we first of all, we have a corner cut, so it's not a, just a rectangle. You also put in like a cut in the wall. So the base is there's nothing here. This is a apartment building or whatever space you move into and it hasn't been set dressed with anything. It's just the space itself. And you want this space to be pretty interesting just on its own. The Z space we play with is that it's lifted up with some uh, blocks, right? And you have some staircase. So just by having this, it's pretty interesting already visually. And again, this is a very simple demonstration for our students. Obviously, it could be a lot more complicated than this, but also the steps got lofts inside, but we want to avoid that. We want to make a simple demonstration to show our students that even a single room with just a cut in the corner with a little step could uh, bring a very interesting design at the very end. So here we are. So we have the chicken on the floor, on uh, a plate, and here's a fork and a knife, and that is it. So what is the next step? So this step here could come from reference. You could go from the internet, look for some good cabin interiors. Uh, you could uh, look for uh, what you call modern ones, old ones, up to you. But try to find one that's interesting, have nice windows on it or a nice uh, floor plan, maybe has building shelves. That's up to you. And again, that's about 90% of the hard work because it really looks kind of good. All right, so let's, uh, let me just turn these off so I don't have too many things open. So, well, let's, uh, let me see. I'm, I'm going to open that just one more time here to show you the what step we're in, right? So we have starting with a good base. Okay, so we have the base. All right, let's close that. Next, we're going to talk about the supporting factors on this chicken. So we can't eat the chicken on the floor. That's not very good. I mean, I guess, whoa, computer just froze. Are we back? Okay, good. I thought the uh, computer froze there for a second. All right, so we're back. Oops, all right. Should I save this just in case? Ah, it's okay. Let's let's gamble and hope this computer don't freeze. But uh, it definitely froze there for a few seconds there. All right, so we're gonna put the chicken on a table so we don't eat it on the floor, even though we can. But that doesn't meet our objective. So that already gives you design, right? Put the chicken on on the table, and this table is gonna be pretty standard. This guy is living in the woods. Don't have that much money. These are gonna be random furniture that's not very expensive, and we give him a little chair so he can sit on that. Okay, what is this? Okay, oh, give me here. Let me uh, close this one. Don't save. Next. Doink. All right. With that, we have life support. Remember earlier we mentioned, let's not putting the function stuff yet, just life support. What are the things here that makes this human being could actually live here? These are the easy details. These are things that are very relatable to all of us because we need these things to sort of live, right? So if he's living here, let's give him a bed. Okay, he probably needs a pillow, some sheets, Probably need a place to put his clothes and shoes and little, little things here, right? So let's give him a little drawer. And he probably has other tables to put his stuff on, which we will uh, slowly add things onto. And a shelf. Shelf is always pretty useful. These are standard things you find in most people's living space, right? So this is freebie details. These have to be there in a way, but it gives you a, a thing to start with. It gives some details to start with, right? So we have that. Let's keep going. Next one is, blink. All right, more life support systems because we have the bed, okay? Then we have the shelf at the table. Okay, now he needs to eat. He needs food, right? Food is part of survival. So we start to put in some food stuff. So here are cans in boxes and outdoors. He's got this kind of uh, outside uh, storage container that has additional frozen foods and also the stuff uh, kept in there, right? Num uh, perishable type stuff. Uh, we also put in how he's going to cook the food, right? So let me just slow it down a bit so we can have logic here. So let me get a layer here. So we started with this chicken. That's number one. Then we put the table. And then we put the life support. That's number three, right? These shelves, these tables. And then we say, okay, he needs more food. That's all part of survival. So we have our four over here. But to cook the food, we need a some kind of heating unit. So in this case, we've added an old stove. Okay. By the way, the style is a little bit cartoony, right? That's Ian's uh, personal style, which is totally fine. Style doesn't come into play here. This could apply for animation. You can apply for real world. The thinking is the same. 
the style you choose to draw it does not affect your designs, right? So in this case, it's a little bit cartoony. That's why we have the kind of a twisted pipes and stuff. Uh, that's Ian's personal touch, and which I don't mind at all. And it's very cool. Okay, so we have the stove. This heats up the food. So with that comes more function. The stove needs a way for the for the smoke to come out. So then that adds the chimney outside, right? So kind of five B, right? Some kind of detail. Okay. That goes in now to power the stove we need to have firewood so then that gives you number six okay and to chop the firewood we need a place to chop it so that gives us number seven so you can see this just keeps going it just adds details without using any brain the whole point of this now this is my fifth time repeating this is to keep you drawing to keep you designing so you don't freeze up and think what do i do next okay so let's keep going here this person needs to travel in and out of this woods he could walk but we decided to add a little vehicle here which is an original uh, original sketch here there's a little crappy sketch of a motorcycle right here right so that way it could go in and out because a car in this neck of the woods probably hard to uh, get in and out so we decided a dirt bike dirt motorcycle probably works now he needs to power that motorcycle so then we have a gas uh, canister, right? That can power the motorcycle. So then we have nine. So just by having this, we have already set dressed this, even though we're far from finished, but the space already is taking place and it's interesting visually. Uh, there's some other stuff here, you need to drink water. That's a big thing for a lot of people, right? We have to drink, so there's cups here and there. Uh, we also have curtains to block out that morning sun and just some little tiny details like pots and pans to cook those meals. That's all part of the small detail that supports that piece of chicken. And Ian put in this little cage. He made up a story like he bought this chicken from uh, from the town and brought it in live like a treat for himself. Uh, so then he has a little cage here, just a little storytelling and some feathers on the floor to show that the chicken was killed in the cavern or something. Okay, So that's pretty neat. I'll leave that here for a second. I'm so nervous that it's going to crash on me. Okay, which one are we? I think we're here. Okay, so we have life support. Next, I'm going to start adding in the actual functionality of this space. Okay, this person is living here. Remember, life support is the basic, it's the freebie. This person has to live here, so we need those things to support it. Now, what is this person actually doing here? This is the functionality part. This is what's going to make this design go from a generic space into a space that's telling a story, and that's your functionality. All right, so this person is a UFO conspiracy kind of person, and if we go back to our references, they have all these radios and all these things to, you know, conspiracy scan the government for, you know, UFO and CIA cover-ups and all that type of stuff. So to have these, we need some shelves, all right? So to so the first thing we added here was a bunch of shelves. So let's refer to our original sketch here. Oh, I'm getting way too many sketches, too many things on the screen here. All right, here we go. It's very rough, but here are our shelves right there, right? Two little shelves to put our things on. So that opens up to the next one. Uh, man, I'm forgetting which one. Okay, number seven. So with the shelves, we could then put our radio equipment. You can see here Ian added a bunch of them, right? It's constantly function over form. We need this, so we put this. We need that, we put this, right? So it just keeps stacking. So it just ease the thinking process, okay? So those shelves are put in, so then we put the radios in, uh, all those different things, receivers, and we distribute them a little bit on the floor because this person is pretty messy, right? Just stacking things everywhere to kind of build in, play in with the whole story. Okay, number eight, All right? Next, we start to add just a little bit more details. So I told him, hey, we should probably have some, uh, you know, uh, mics and stuff like that, some headphones. Uh, let's add some piece of paper because to uh, scan these, you probably need to write stuff down. So we added some piece of paper, some pen, all these things, or oh, add a light source to light up the chicken. So the light things comes in, uh, which we mentioned earlier. The stove is a light source as well. Okay, let's keep going. So let's go with nine. Here it goes nine. All right, keep going with this. For this to work, we need some antennas and some receivers, right? So we added those to the roof, and instantly that breaks up the silhouette of the cabin and gives us a little bit more uh, visual details, but that detail came from this, and this came from the shelves, right? And the shelves came from putting on the table, and the table came from this guy's working here. I know I'm repeating myself many, many times, but this is how we teach class here at the school. We keep repeating these every single week until this stuff starts to stick with our students. All right, so that's number nine. Let's open number 10. Here's 10, all right? Still going to function, because to power all this, this is probably a lot of electricity, so it's probably jacking some of the electricity from the city by uh, running some illegal power. But we also want to have a backup system. So these things not, not need a lot of power, so let's dangle a bunch of wires to run the power. And let's run the power source to the outside. So we have two generators here, uh, gas power generators. 
and that is a free B detail. And to power the generators, we use the same gas tank that this person is using for the motorcycle. So those green uh, gas canisters are outside. So how many times have you heard me repeat this already, right? All of this so far, we haven't really designed anything. It's all based on function over form. Because you need one, then you get two. Because you have two, you get three, right? You just keep working on the function. Uh, let's keep going here. This is number, what number are we at? This is number 10. Let's open number 11. 11, what's next? All right, 11 is, let me see, I'm trying to figure, oh, did I just open 11 already? Or some detail, let me compare real quick because I think I just opened 11 already because it looks the same to me. Unless these two are the same. What, are they the same, are they the same? I think these two are the same. I can't figure it out. But anyways, right? So let's go open 12 then. That's the case. 12. All right. 12, we're starting to get some ah, personal details that are coming in, right? So here we start to discuss, okay, with this radio equipment, what is he actually doing with it? So what do you say he's taking notes? So that's one detail. The other one is that these things probably constantly break down. So he has an area where he's fixing some of these. So he's taking it apart, he's got some screws. This guy's probably pretty smart. He's got some computer and electronic uh, experience. So we're putting that, but all this is still part of the function of the space. Next, we have to take those notes and make some type of theory, right? If you have a conspiracy theorist, he has to write these conspiracies down somewhere. So we have we have the standard the thing you see in every entertainment uh, movie or <laughs> video game, right? The kind of the the, uh, the spider web board where everything leads to everything, right? The the crazy uh, the web, and we have a little bit here as well, and some pasties over here. So that way, this function start to get distributed across the space, so it's not just in one single area. Okay, so that's number twelve. Let's open number thirteen. Thirteen. Doink. All right, so this is, I believe, ah, we have to use up this table, right? The previous table was empty. So we thought, okay, we need a computer to start implementing all this because with this only, it's hard for this person to actually document everything. So let's give him an old computer. This is kind of like a 1990s style uh, design here, not modern. So give him a very boxy CRT uh, computer screen, a bad old keyboard, right? some shelves, and another light source here as well. A, uh, a dot matrix printer to uh, print all his conspiracies out to print on the walls, right? Because where this paper comes from, where they come from, this printer over here. So all these things are just keep building one on top of the another. All right, so number 13. Let's open 14. We're getting close here. All right. 14 is just set dressing the shelf that was blank earlier. So to operate all this equipment, we thought we need some manuals. These things, even though you're pretty good with these, with that many things. We probably need some manuals, we need some books, we need some maps, we need all the kind of support system to run all these conspiracies. So we use the bookshelves for that, right? So all the books are gonna go in here, uh, some piece of paper on the floor. So still in the green, because the green is the functionality part, right? The blue is life support, green is function, okay? So red is the, uh, the beginning of the chicken, and the chicken itself is orange, okay? So just keep that in mind as we look at the final here. Number 15, all right. So last thing we added is personal items, right? Remember we said little tiny things that start to make this person who they are. So these little purple things, let's zoom in here, are showing that. So this person, cigarette, that adds a lot of atmosphere, you know, conspiracy person smoking a cigarette while playing with radios, looks pretty good. So we added those cigarettes in, and I believe that's in our references as well, uh, somewhere over here. Maybe not this one. I'll find you the one that has it. Okay, so we have smoking. Uh, I don't know what that box is for. We have some pair of slippers going on over here and uh, some books that he's reading. More cigarettes next to shotgun shells, which is not that safe. But got some weapons over here, got some boots. These are things that belong to this person. A hunting rifle to maybe like hunt a rabbit here and there. Uh, and also shows that this person is armed. Tells a little bit more of a story. Okay, so this is all the multiple layers, and we started all of this with just this chicken. Okay, chicken, and that led to this. And we didn't design, you know, I know it sounds weird, but we actually didn't design anything. We just used logic. Okay, so let me show you the final drawing, which is really cool. Uh, let me back up a step and open up Ian's drawing. He added even a little bit more detail on top of this one, which is really cool, all right? So here's. Uh, Whoa, okay, I thought I froze again. Here's Ian. Let me close some files because it's getting really slow. Okay. Every time Apple updates their system, it just gets slower and slower. Let me close this. As well. I'll keep that one open. Let's close this. All right, hopefully that's better. 
All right, here we go. So here's Ian's final drawing. Let's first zoom out, show you a beautiful line art that he's done on top of this. Really cool. And let's go back onto the chicken. Here we go. All right, let me start a new layer. So I'll show you all the details he added. So we start with the chicken that's eating this. And it's got the cigarettes, got some salt. It's got a, maybe a paper plate, maybe a glass plate. It's got a little light source here. Oh, by the way, we also have the materials, all that stuff added, right? So we have wooden floors, we have carpets, we have different type of material here, different kind of wood here, different type of tables. So lots of different materials happening here, which is uh, cool for the eyes, right? even the uh, stove itself. Oh, okay, so back to the chicken. And then we have all the life support stuff, like his bed, his pillows, uh, his, uh, his trunk to put his clothes in. Uh, we have some shelves. And then we start with the functionality of the space, which are all these cool little radio sets, tons of them. The more, the better, right? Because this guy is all just crazy, scanning government things. Um, with that, we have the uh, antennas that attach to these things, all the receivers, and to power all that, we have the uh, portable generators. Oh, by the way, here's all the food stuff that's out here, right? These anti-bear type of things, uh, so the animals don't get to it. Uh, so we have the gas. The gas is also powering the motorcycle that he has here. Here's our here's our dude with the uh, the silver uh, silver aluminum foil hats. <laughs> right? Here's a firewood to support the uh, stove that's inside. Uh, a couple of guns, a couple of weapons. Uh, here a bunch of the UFO things that uh, he's uh, breaking down here somehow. I think the UFO is related to the chicken. Here's a drumstick. Uh, I don't know what Ian's doing here, but it's pretty funny stuff that uh, he's putting in here in terms of detail. Uh, here's his old computer with uh, KFC. I think that's supposed to be <laughs> KFC Colonel, Colonel Sanders here. Pretty funny details here. Uh, here's printing some stuff out. Lots of cigarette packages, lots of smoke everywhere. Old 90s mouth. So these things are really, really fun to look at because there's just so much cool detail. And I think they added a pet. I remember we mentioned something like a move in this set. So we have a little kitty cat, which is also wearing a uh, aluminum foil here. Uh, any other details that we see here? Uh, some indicated scratches on the steps to show usage. Yeah, so in terms of animation, we have leaves that could be blown in the wind. We have curtains that could move. We have this hole in the wall, which could blow some wind in here. We have smoke that could come out. Uh, we have the cat that could move. And as you walk around the steps, the sound design could also make the wood creak in all the sorts of uh, interesting ways. So yeah, so this is a pretty cool example that was done just for our students. So they could see the final result could look intimidating. But once we start to break this process down, you can see it was all done with logic. There wasn't a single item adding, which was like, hey, let's just add this for the sake of adding it. It all came from because of something, therefore we added this. So um, yeah, so that's what this episode is all about. So let me take another break here and I'll wrap up this episode by showing you some other examples done by Ian for our students. Uh, so you can see how cool uh, this logic is because all the other demo demonstrations is using the exact same rule book, which is good base, put stuff in it, put a functionality, in detail, personal items, lights, materials, done. Okay, so all right, let me pause here and we'll uh, get that going. All right, so let's show you some uh, other designs, but before doing so, I really want to break this down. Let's use, uh, let's use the image viewer because it's probably easier to view these steps since they are built right on top of each other. So let's go for the first one, right? Here's our chicken <laughs> by itself. And then chicken in the room by itself. So base and what we need to start with. Then we put the first functionality. You gotta put the chicken on a table and a chair to eat it, to sit down. Okay, now we have life support system, bed, shelves, table. So this person can actually live here. And to live here, we need to have some support uh, things for food, for heat, right? Different, uh, basically your basic shelter type stuff. So we added food, we added the, uh, the stove, the motorcycle to get in and out, the gas to power the motorcycle, the axe to chop the wood, right, and so forth and so forth. And then we get to the functionality, which is he's a UFO conspiracy series, so we have to put all the equipment. So to put the equipment, we need the shelves. Once the shelves are there, we can put the equipment. With that equipment, you need to do something with that equipment. So here comes all the paper, all the microphones, the lights, the lamps. And then those equipment are hooked up to other equipment that's on the roof that can scan the, uh, the governments, right? And then to power those, we need some powers to uh, steal some energy from the government as well as his own backup generators that we have two outside. And the generators are powered by gas. So we have the gas canisters, whoops, wrong way. And then we have some little details that one of the equipment being fixed. And then all the conspiracies are printed on the walls. To print those things, we need a computer. So the computer is put in here with the printer and the keyboard, right? All that detail. And then lastly, we have some stuff here that supports the equipment, like books, manuals, maps, so forth that support that. 
And lastly, we have the uh, the personal items, some guns, some books, some personal uh, shoes, uh, slippers, uh, just uh, smoking, right, the, his cigarettes. And with that, we have the uh, the final image that uh, we just showed you, which is which one? This this one. Okay. So that's our final image. So I'll put this on my Twitter so you guys could all uh, grab a high res version and uh, try this yourselves. Uh, I just put this one here and I showed this to you. This is the one with the uh, cigarette, I believe, right? So this is an in between when Ian was just starting this um, sketch 3D model. I went in there and just put a few more notes. Uh, but same thing that we just talked about earlier, right? So UFO hunter lives in a small cabin, lots of 90s radio, it's messy, claustrophobic, spends 16 hours a day listening to uh, headphones, scanning different receivers, smokes, drinks soda, read magazines, eats junk food, right? Gets chicken from the market. So, and I put some additional reference images here as well. So you can see some of the cabin references that we used, uh, all the crazy radios that uh, we want to capture, uh, the outdoor storage unit, so forth and so forth. Okay, let's close that. We'll leave this here because that's going to be our last review. Let me turn off all the ugly fonts. All right, Ian's other work. Let's take a look. Let's look at uh, let's look at this one first. This one's pretty good. Okay, so this is one he just finished uh, last week. Very cool. Am I missing one of these? I'm missing the external view. Oh no, here it is. Okay, so this is a demonstration to do a set design within a vehicle. Okay. So this is also one of our assignments at the school. So we call this the long voyage in which students have to take a vehicle and design it so it could go from A to B, but it also has a functionality attached to it. And we need to sense that functionality from the vehicle itself. So what we've done here is I give Ian a kind of a pretend uh, Assassin's Creed type of vehicle. Remember in Syndicate, they had this train that goes around the, uh, the city that you could also use as a player base. So we took that concept and thought, would it be cool if they also had a ship that uh, drove around to different cities, right? Or sailed around to different cities. So Ian started this demonstration by using a good base. This is actually a real boat that he found. Uh, we have blueprints, we have all the detailed stuff for this boat. So therefore, it does 90% of the work for you. This boat has a really nice, or ship I should say, really nice uh, bridge area. It's got a nice form to it. Pretty much what you see 90% here is the real deal. The proportions is off of a blueprint. So nothing here is made up, okay? But to make it work as a function, we added a lot of external stuff. But let's get to that later. Let's look at this first. Start with the easy stuff, the functionality, right? So this bridge is pretty much what it is on the real deal. Everything here is according to reference. But Ian did add some really nice personal details in here. For example, the tea, cookies, and so forth, right? This part is function. The captain here is not part of you, the player character, right? Kind of like the person driving the train in Assassin's Creed. They're not part of your clan, but they're working for you. But here, you're not going to put too many personal items associated with the assassin. You're just going to put stuff that makes this place work. So your wheels, your compasses, your binoculars, your uh, throttles, right? All these things need to be here. I think that's a fire hydrant, right? All that here, the map chart room with the saxtons and you know all your compasses. Those are all functionality. And Ian did a great job getting all those in here. And none of this requires any kind of brain thinking. It's just pure function, pure reference gathering. Uh, but it looks really, really good. Right. I love all these little details you put in here. So again, this is real. This bridge looks just like this in the real world. Um, so nothing here was really made up. Uh, set dressing was designed in there, but everything else is as is, including this whole entire unit here, uh, how this looks. And this is what we tell our students all the time. If you have a good base, look how cool this looks, right? And you didn't really do that much hard work, but, but doing this does take a lot of time. So when you practice using this type of, um, uh, I guess, this step by step, you will learn a ton from this. It prevents you from burning out. It prevents you from going, man, what do I draw? I'm getting a, uh, I guess, a, a creativity block. This kind of stops it from happening. And because students, they do a lot of homework throughout the year, we have to teach it this way to prevent students from going, man, I'm just, I don't, I'm not creative anymore. But in this kind of case, the creativity is, is a very small percent of it, right? 90% of it is just designing from good reference and using good base. So again, in the real world, we do the same thing to prevent ourselves from just getting burned out, okay? Uh, all right, so there's lots of cool stuff here. I'm noticing all the little wires I put in here. Look at all these cool stuff, all these little intricate details. He's got the wet footprint coming in, so the wood is not exactly new. These are all really cool. All right, let's move into the uh, bedroom. 
right? So below the deck here, which is indicated here, we have our main player's uh, cabin. So this will be the assassin's person's room. So we build in this really cool floor glass thing because in the old Assassin's Creed, like in, uh, in two, I believe in the third one as well, you have these rooms. I think the French one, the Paris one has it as well, you, where you could display all your armor. So we thought it'd be really cool if this motif is on the top, but I could go in, penetrate through the cabin itself and go one more layer and below will be where all your different outfits are stored, probably in a circle. So you can imagine down below this step, we have eight or something uh, different suits. So you can go down there and check it out. Be kind of cool, right? And it's a nice little motif. Uh, we put in the uh, the Cree logo here. Yeah. We use Assassin's Creed quite a bit here because a lot of our students they work for Ubisoft, and a lot of them they want to work on these Creed projects. So, uh, so yeah, we use this like, as a good example. So let's go into the uh, functionality. So this is a cabin. Its job purely is for this person to live, but it also started with functions. So we need a bed. The bed we need lights, materials, right? All the different sounds come out. We need uh, the personal things like food water, uh, it's got some little personal posters here, uh, books, uh, we have some functionality thing going here, for example, the anchor chain going, looks really cool, and then that's separated from a living area where you have a living room, uh, also the drinks, wine, uh, I think he's writing letters or something, some fun stuff here, Ian loves to highlight details in here, and they're pretty fun to capture, uh, to discover, right, here's some, uh, some English breakfast and sausage, more tea, I don't know, these are some kind of poison virus or something, uh, lots of cool stuff, checking out maps here for his next target. Oh yeah, because of Assassin, right? So he's all the targets, looks like some kind of museum that's going to be targeting. Uh, obviously, here's the, uh, the mind map again. Really cool stuff. And of course, the weapons that the Assassin will need. So they're displaying this nice uh, green felt material. Pretty neat. One of the guns we've taken out, is that gun somewhere in the room? Oh, there it is. Check it out. That's a cool detail, right? So this gun is not inside its uh, holder, and it's actually leaning against the, uh, the mast that comes down from the uh, from the top there. Pretty cool, we have a walkway here and there's a little bathroom here as well. This is a nice uh, nice ship because these guys are pretty rich, it's Assassin's Creed, right? You look at their, their home and their setup, they're all custom made, they're custom set dressed and we definitely wanna capture that here as well. Really nice job on this uh, interior. I love looking through all his details, right? And then let's go to the external to finish. So here we have the external of the ship. So we already saw the, uh, the glass window here, the bridge we took a look at. Uh, we have some supplies up here. We dress the chimney up a bit. The original chimney only goes to about here. So we just made it a little higher just to give a nice detail and added some of these kind of um, design motifs to break this ship up and also give it the same forms found in the Assassin's Creed logo. So we could gel this design together. And then the back area, we have a little lounge area to hang out and a, uh, a boat. And here's the biggest feature we added because without this, the boat was looking kind of default. We thought, can we make something kind of gamey? Something that makes the player go, wow, this, that was pretty cool. But at first glance, we actually don't know what it is. So at first glance, this thing is actually hidden. We have these metal panels that come down and hide this mechanic. So this mechanic is once those panels lift upwards, this, um, I guess, a mechanical arm drops down and connects with this, kind of like a roller coaster connecting. And from here, we have these gliding airplanes that could come down, hook up to the launcher and launch out like a, like a very early version of an aircraft carrier, right? Because it's steam launch or um, what you call it, could be pulled by a pulley. So we come down here, we shoot these guys out and they could go flying, right? Uh, and the reason why we chose a bird is because Assassin's Creed used the bird motif quite a bit. Uh, they have doves, right? In all the recent Assassin's Creed, you have the hawk and the eagles, whatever. So flying tends to be quite a big thing for them. And I believe that was always the case in the previous games as well, uh, because they are flying from high towers and deep down. I think Enzio's outfit looks like a little bit like a bird as well. So I thought this was a cool detail to add and gives the player a nice little surprise when they discover this, because uh, you only see the external part when you uh, first arrive on the boat. You might not know exactly what it does, but once this panel opens up, say in the, uh, maybe the second act or something, we'll let you use this, the player will be entertained by this type of stuff. And that is our job, to entertain our players. Okay, so, but I do wanna repeat that this thing was pretty much 90% referenced from real world but then set dress using the rule that we explained here. All right, so let me close these and show you just a few more. 
Uh, this one's pretty cool to show an example. By the way, these are all things our students do for homework. So the ship one, our students do as a homework as well. This one is another one uh, in one of the homework assignments, which is a camping site. So this homework does the same thing, except this breaks it even further down to functionality. So when you have a remote campsite, the students really have to ask themselves, how did these things get here? What are they doing here? What are they eating here? And how are they surviving here? So a great exercise to learn about function over form. So here, Ian decided to use a kind of a Canadian uh, beaver plane that comes in. These are fishermen that's coming here to camp. Uh, this is a pretty luxurious camping site for sure, but it's pretty cool. A lot of entertaining stuff going on here. So they're grilling, uh, grilling meat and sausages. They caught some fish over here. They got some really big fish. Um, the marshmallow, marshmallow with hot chocolate. This is like the ideal entertainment campsite, but it's really cool as an exercise. And the way you start these is to start with one thing, okay? What are they doing here? Are they hunting? Are they on vacation? How did they get here? Is it by canoe? Did they hike in? Did they come in with a Land Rover? Right, all these things is part of the design exercise for you to start with just one thing and expand out from that. So uh, yeah, here's a little doggy. He's got a uh, grilled fish as well. and. Uh, his little home. He's got his own little tent. So it's pretty fun, very entertaining. And uh, we'll be putting all these on Twitter so you guys could take a closer look on uh, how this works. And there's a lot of equipment here, but everything is foldable. As you can see, the table folds up, the tent obviously folds up. Uh, even this little guy folds up, you can see. Right? And the beaver can actually carry all this. So we did look into all this stuff here. The beaver is a, is a workhorse, like a truck. Uh, one of Canada's really cool uh, products. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the Ablin, right? The Ablin beaver. So it's a very powerful plane that could go in and out of bush strips uh, into inaccessible places. And this is a float version, so you can land on uh, water. So, yeah, so you can actually carry a lot of things with it. So, all right. Lastly, let's show you one more before we end this episode. So this is one called the Traveling Merchant, another exercise done in our school. So the idea here is that we have to design a vehicle. It does not be modern. It could be his, you know, historic, it could be fantasy, some kind of vehicle that could take a merchant from point A to point B. So you saw that in uh, like fall has these, like the, those uh, vermin, you know, those cows that walk around in the fall world. That's one in Breath of the Wild in Zelda. You have those merchants that carry a big backpack, backpack with them. So those are all mobile merchants. So in this case, Ian used a truck and it's going to do like a 7-Eleven mobile. Right, which is a really fun idea. And this truck also came from some reference image that he found, some kind of old military uh, truck. So he used that as a base, and that gave him about 90% of the details that we needed. And then the rest was referenced from, here's, here it is, uh, deployed. Uh, so all this, a lot of these reference came from 7-Eleven uh, Japan. So these cooking areas, all, how, all these cafes are distributed. Ian had a ton of references for these. So these demos are very, very specific. They're done for our school because in the real world, you might not see too many of this kind of stuff in entertainment products. We're pushing these to even a higher level in terms of what we require from students because the point of these is to really teach students to think about the design process, to use logical thinking to arrive at a solution versus drawing, for example, a fantasy creature or fantasy world. Even though those are really fun and they do come later on in the terms, we find to teach it that way to students is very difficult because it's very hard to critique. Because if you make up a random world, a random history without any kind of base, without any kind of logic, it's hard to tell the students there's some mistake here or something doesn't look right because it's completely subjective. And when you teach that way, generally the students who draw well will do well. The students who don't draw well, they have a hard time because it's very hard to push them in a good general direction because simply it's a made up thing. They don't draw it well. As a teacher, how do you fix it? Because there's no logic behind it. But if we have, for example, the cabin that we saw earlier, there are a lot of logic behind those designs. So the students forgot, for example, the fireplace. Right? Let me just open that up real quick to use that as our wrap up. Okay. Imagine your homework is to do a cabin in the woods for a UFO conspiracy person. And they don't have a bed. You go, okay, where does he sleep? They don't have a stove. Where did they cook? All those things are good, positive feedback to give to students that don't demoralize them and also teaches students to go, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So next time when I do these assignments, let me put those notes down so I don't forget and I slowly improve, okay? And the point of today's episode, today's episode is to do the exact same thing for you guys because I know a lot of you are students. So we learn to design. Hopefully you could try, give this a try, which is just use functional form, use logic, use step-by-step -step breakdown, 
to get your desire. And I'll, I'll put this on the Twitter as well. So where you guys, I'll just leave it here on full screen so you can write it down. We encourage our students to just print this page out, uh, big, nice and big, right? Like 11 by 17 if you're in the States or A3, and just put it right in front of your work area. So as you do your designs, look up at the wall and check it. Go, okay, do I have this? Do I have this? Do I have that? Because if you don't, then put those in. Because when we check the homework, we do the exact same thing. All right. All right, guys. So I think that kind of wraps it up for episode 109. Um, I probably have another one follow up in 110. We'll see uh, how my time goes. But thank you so much for watching. And uh, I apologize once again for the crazy delay. But that was fun. Uh, I kind of enjoyed this episode. Kind of uh, warm up to it as I record here. So yeah, so I'll see you guys in episode 110. This is Feng Zhu signing off. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.